started. I'm so glad to be here to tell you the story of recreating the Du Bois data portraits. These are the data visualizations that W.E.B. Du Bois created in 1900 for the Paris Exposition. But I always like to begin the story with the people that helped him. The people at Atlanta University in 1900. Here you have the debating team and a set of very beautiful women on the steps at Atlanta University that worked with him. This is Du Bois in 1900, 32 years old in Paris. His idea was to tell the story of the progress of Black people since emancipation. On the left, you have his picture. He had just come over from Steerage. He worked on the project very, very quickly to get it out to tell the world. On the right-hand side, you see the venue for the exposition. But before I want to get into that, it's very interesting and important to give a historical context to what was happening around this time. So let's start uh, in 1895. In the summer of 1895 in a Brooklyn park, there was a cotton plantation complete with 500 black workers reenacting slavery. This was called Black America, 1895. The next year, the landmark Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson was handed down that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. The next year in 1897, Du Bois undertook what's called the Philadelphia Negro study, where he studied the plight and the conditions of Black people that lived in Philadelphia at the time. This is a landmark sociological study. The next year in 1898, the duly elected people in Wilmington, North Carolina was violently overthrown by a group of 2,000 white men. They expelled the opposition of Black and white political leaders from the city. They destroyed property and businesses of black citizens built up since the Civil War, including the only black newspaper, and killed an estimated of 60 to 300 people. In 1899, the year before the Paris Exposition, lynchings peaked in Georgia. There were 27, including the horrific lynching of Sam Hose in April of that year. Between 1890 and 1900, Georgia averaged more than one mob killing per month. Black lives really didn't matter in those days. And then that's leading us to the Paris Exposition, where Du Bois, in my view, wanted to show three things. He wanted to say, we are here. We are part of this nation. This is who we are. This is our occupations. These are the things that we do. And this is how far we have come in the 35 years since emancipation. Going back to the venue, this was a, a small section in the Paris Exposition in 1900. And it's important to know that there was an international audience and he wanted to be able to capture their attention. And if you look carefully, you'll see their poster size uh, visualizations there. I've pasted in my recreations here just to give you a view of what that might have looked like as you walked past it. It's interesting here to see that uh, the poster size, these were poster size visualizations, 22 by 28 inches size. And the scale is very interesting to me that these were not just small things that we see on the screen, but large posters. So let's go over the taxonomy of these visualizations. First of all, about 50% of them were bars, and then about 15, 60% were maps. Then we have what we call blocks, and then circles, and then graphs. Let's go through them briefly. <clears throat> 
So there are many, many bars if you look at the collection of about 60 or so visualizations. And they, they run the gamut from the sort of traditional bar charts that you see today. And here you can sort of see the color palette as well. And um, you see some are very interesting. In fact, one that shows sort of the shape of uh, the state of Georgia there. And again, using the bold colors. There are many maps as part of the visualizations as well, including the one that started off the ones showing um, the slave trade from Africa to North and South America, and many uh, choroplasts, um, including those of the state of Georgia, showing population and um, things as well. And also you see um, showing Black people as part of an international nation within a nation. Again, this was an international um, organization. Many people, when they see the Du Bois uh, visualization, see the curves, the, this famous Du Bois spiral. And in fact, when I first saw this work, it was interesting to me to say, how, what, how might I recreate them? You can see the circular forms, including the Du Bois spiral, and using them in simple forms here, the sort of uh, target chart, and the one, one of my favorites, the fan chart, which you see here, and you also see it behind me. He also used visualizations that use bold blocks of color, including the one on the upper left here that uses the color in the blocks that contrasts the state of slave versus free population. And they use the traditional graphs that you would see today. Again, all of these were hand-drawn, recreated, uh, pen and ink and so forth in 1900. In doing the recreations, I found that there was a well-defined color palette and it was interesting to be able to define what they are. You see the black, the brown, and the tan, which Du Bois used to denote things like skin color. Um, but also you'll see the black, the red, and the green, which presaged the Pan-African flag, which was created in 1920. Typography was interesting as part of doing these recreations. I use public sands and charter. Um, and in fact, they, there has been a typeface called Du Bois that was created by Trey Seals from Vocal Type um, that is also being to recreating the hand lettering that you saw on the original uh, visualizations. This is the book for me that started it all. I found out about this book when um, in 2017, right before it was published, W.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits Visualizing Black America by Whitney Battle Baptiste and Britt Russell. This book became my constant companion, and of course, here it is now. <clears throat> if you open it up, you'll see the, uh, the visualizations laid out here. And this was my reference as I did the recreations. It's interesting when I was going through the visualizations to think about, you know, how they did it in 1900, pen and ink and water kit color and paper, and they used an expo. Today, we use scripting and digital fonts and PDFs and the internet. We're able to use what I call the megaphone, the modern megaphone to get the word out. He was, um, restricted by one space and, and one venue. But here we can get the, the word out as I'm talking to you today over the internet. In recreating the visualizations, I had to go analog. As you can see, this is me um, measuring things to make sure that I got the angles and the proportions just right. These visualizations were created by a tool called Dexia, which is a domain-specific language um, that I created in the Go programming language that has these particular features. 
In fact, the presentation that you're looking at now was created in Nextshell. It works by placing objects on a percent grid. And here's sort of my workflow. Um, there's the code on the left, there's the output in the middle, and then there's the reference. So I can make tweaks and change it, hit a button, see the generated output, and then compare it to the reference. I like to use this one as sort of an example of how the design went. This is also one of my favorite ones, the income and expenditure, showing how people in various socioeconomic classes um, spent their money. It's interesting to see how that's broken down into you have a section for the title, a section for category, excuse me, and then income and then the charts in the middle. It's interesting to think about it in terms of these zones. Here's just a bit of a breakdown of the work. Um, I recreated 27 plates a uh, total of about 6,500 lines of code, and average lines of code per visualization, about 100. Uh, many of them were hand-coded, but for some cases, for example, for the maps, they were machine-generated. And that's kind of an interesting approach. You can have a program generate data for another program, meta-programming, to, um, to, to generate the visualizations. For code management and automation, it's very important to organize the work. Every visualization has its directory, which has um, the output. It has the data um, and CSV files, the script files. And then you can make the individual visualizations, individual ones. You can make the images, you can make PDFs, or you can make them all. And then all of this is controlled with source code controls source code control um, using Git and GitHub. All of the things that you see here are up on GitHub, by the way. Let's walk through a few examples just to sort of see and give you a flavor for how the recreations happen. This is one of the simple ones where you see the data on the left and then the bar chart on the right. Um, this is sort of the, the structure of a deck begins with deck and it ends with deck and you've got a slide and the ending of the slide. And you just throw in some text and then you specify the chart and boom, there you've got it. That's probably one of the simpler ones. This one is interesting in that it's both basically made up of abstract shapes. Um, this is one of the blocks um, where you specify things like the hierarchy, uh, H1, H2, H3, for the text. You specify the objects. In this case, there are two arcs, arc one and arc two. And then you lay out two lines that shows the proportions. And then you decorate it with a few other things. So a, a kind of bold one like this is just done with these few lines of color. This one, um, which shows the progress from slavery to being tenant farmers and so forth, shows how you, know, you specify your colors, specify all your proportions from the left and the right, and then you simply draw them. It's interesting to think about the Du Boisian style. And in fact, I have a document that tries to define that. And to try to look at, okay, this is what they did in 1900. What does this look like for modern data? Turns out some other people are doing this as well. At Princeton University, the VIZ labs are looking at student debt and racial disparities. And they use the Du Boisian style um, to good effect for that. This is part of the dignity and debt um, program that they have there in Princeton. Here's an example of using modern data. On the left, you have the original occupations of Negroes and whites in Georgia from 1900. And it's interesting to look at um, <clears throat> how things have changed or how things are the same. So for example, the two red slices, uh, black people on the right, the white people on the bottom, 
it was pretty much an agrarian society back then, pretty much equal 62 versus 64 percent in agriculture and fisheries. But the one I also like to, to point out is 28 percent in domestic service versus 5 percent. Um, and then, you know, for um, professions, very, very small, vanishingly small. And then you can see looking at what it looked like in 2019. Again, I'm using data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. 31% management and professional versus 41%. Um, and also things like professions have increased. So it's good to show the progress. Here is the modern and original for the expenditures. Again, um, there's the original on the left. This one is very interesting in that it's kind of the multimedia one. It kind of breaks the mold from the other ones. It has embedded photographs and sort of gold leaf with the embedded chart. And then showing the same thing for modern data. A final example here is this is a chloropleth map. Um, the relative Negro population of the states of the United States from 1900, again, comparing that with 2021, again, using data from, from modern sources. My final example on that is also um, people are using this kind of style um, data from the social sciences. Um, this is from Professor Charlie Eaton of UC Merced, showing um, profit, for-profit um, colleges and their impact. In February of this year, I partnered with Alan Hillary and CQ Tyler to create what's called the Du Bois Challenge. Their idea was, why don't we go on Twitter and challenge the people there and say, here are a curated set of Du Bois visualizations. Have at going about the recreation of those. And this was a really, really fun and project. And in fact, if you go on Twitter and put in the hashtag Du Bois Challenge, um, you'll see very, very interesting work there. Here's some examples of people that went through that. Um, we uh, coordinated with other people like Tidy Tuesday. Um, there's Charlie Eaton ones there. And um, very, very interesting. In fact, if you go to the link below, you can see the rules for the challenge. And I really encourage you to go back and, and take a look at this work. And in fact, if you like to um, participate, you can still do so. All of the data that you've seen here is in GitHub repos, github.com, AJ Starks, Du Bois data portraits, the code, the data, as well as github.com, AJ Starks, modern Du Bois visualizations are there. Here's a set of links and resources, and I'll make sure that the slides are available if you want to go back and, and take a look. That's my time. This is how you can get a hold of me. Thank you very much. I love presenting this work and making sure that everybody is aware how much of a data visualization social scientist um, W.E.B. Du Bois was. I'm happy to take any kind of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. There was a, a comment that I just wanted to highlight that um, someone came for the tech and they got a history lesson, which I can definitely <laughs> agree with. Uh, got a history lesson too, as a bonus. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, to, to that end, I think it's really important to really put the historical context as to what was happening, and, and you know, even how it 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 mirrors the kinds of things that are happening today. You know, there's the overthrowing of an election and what happened in January 6th and the lynching and George Floyd and all of those things. 
Does any, I didn't see any questions in the chat. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Hi, Crystal. This is Winona, and thank you, Anthony, for that presentation. I am just wowed. Um, there's so much family history for my family in Georgia. My mom was a graduate of Clark College. Um, I attended Clark Atlanta in my undergrad, and of course, we learned so much information about um, Professor Dubois. However, like as, as a data professional, I never knew this part of it, and it's really interesting to I, I guess kind of juxtapose like all of that information aside each other. I'm curious to know um, where your interest started in beginning to recreate the visualizations. Yeah, that's that's an interesting story. So um, again, um, in I, I live in New Jersey and there is a meetup called the Data Visualization New York. And um, in 2017, I believe, um, Right before you know this book was was published, someone gave a presentation on network, and again, like you, I was unaware of that, and I'd been creating these tools, Deck Shell, and so forth, and I said, you know what, I'd love to be able to recreate those things, and you know that that idea rummaged around in my head, and then um, some other folks had began to publish. The work Jason Forrest from the Data Visualization Society, who's a big scholar in this area, <coughs> excuse me, started working on that. And I said, okay, now's the time to do it. And in 2019, while I was on vacation, I said, let's start. So I would just, you know, thumb through the book, find ones that were interesting, and just went through them one by one. So that's the story of how that was created. It's interesting to note that, you know, as I was developing my own tools to do this, you know, if there was something I couldn't do, I could just add it right to the to the tools itself. And that's one of the lessons that I want to tell people about this work. Um, you, if you look at the taxonomy and the, and, and the work there, they didn't necessarily, they were inventing this on the fly. So when you're doing your own visualizations and you're doing your own data work, my lesson to you is don't necessarily take the defaults. Look through how you make and really express what you want to do and, you know, invent things like, you know, the, the fan chart that you see here. Uh, that's a unique thing that they created, never being seen. And I'm trying to wake it up again. In fact, I have tools that you can create your own fan charts as well. So um, I always tell people, you know, when Du Bois was doing this work, to think about, you know, the intent of what you're doing. They wanted to show the world our progress since emancipation. And don't be afraid to break the mold and be bold and to use your own tools to do it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? I will never complain about Tableau or Google Data Studio again. I think I will never forget when you said he did all this with pen and, pen and ink. I mean, I knew it, but just hearing it and seeing it, um, yeah, I'm never complaining about that blow again. Uh, there, there is another question in the chat uh, from Amanda. Is there data that you'd love to spend more time with, either from Du Bois or other scholars? And are there other historical data sets that we should be spending more time with as a collective? Yeah, that's interesting. In fact, I mentioned, you know, the Philadelphia Negro that was done, you know, a couple of years prior to that. There's a lot of data there. Um, in fact, if you look at it, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat, the, the link to that. Um, there's, you know, it's in tables and charts, and you can sort of see where he began the sort of journey there. So that's one historical data set that you can look at. Um, there are other, you know, modern data sets that are interesting to look at. In fact, you know, there's one that I recently learned of called the Police Scorecard. I please believe it's policescorecard.org um, that shows, you know, the, the relative effectiveness of, of policing throughout the United States. That's another data set that you can look at. Again, there's all kinds of data. You know, we're living in a data world right now. You could pull this in 
And I encourage people to, again, study this work and try to use those kind of data sets um, for, um, for using the Du Boisian style. Looks like Vladimir has raised his hand. Oh, oh I, I don't know if you were done with your thought. I just wanted to give you a big shout out on Thanks. the work that you're doing. Um, and I, you know, I thoroughly appreciated the presentation. Um, like I said, I, I came in for the tech because you and I with Cross Path and you know GoForCon and some of the stuff you've done online um, in the Go community. But seeing this presentation. I mean, it, it blew me away, especially the uh, historical context and, and putting everything in perspective and the sheer amount of work you must have done just to get the craft. I mean, first of all, you have a language and translating all that in, into the actual code to do the, uh, the, the UI. So, you know, big shout out and again, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Mm. Hello, Coloma. Hi. Um, hi. Hi, it's Chioma. Thank you so much for this. So I I heard just a little bit about um, W. E. B. Du Bois and like his data work, but like I just seeing this kind of like opened up my mind so much more and inspired me, and especially like seeing how much work you put into it as well. So some of these things I'm seeing is so new to me. Um, but also just like very inspiring as a black person in data. And I'm also just like curious, are there any other like black people in history that you would encourage us to like look into um, in terms of data? Like I've heard of Ida B. Wells' work. Correct. Um, and yeah, I'm just curious of others. That's the one that, that comes to mind, especially, you know, her work on, um, on anti-lynching and so forth. Um, I want to point you to um, a course that I took called um, People, let's see, what is it called? It's from, um, it just flew out of my head. But there's a course, again, I'll, I'll link it in, in the chat, that really goes into the history of design um, for Black people. Silas Monroe did this one, in fact. You know, give me a second. I will, I will find that for you. It's basically a, a, a rich history of of people of color in, in design and visualization as well. So I'll, I'll link to that. It's a uh, BIPOC design history, by the way. Um, thank you everyone for joining and for the great questions. And we will be seeing you at another one. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>